Welcome everybody to a brand new episode of my Dane Talk for Educators Live, the show for the unsung heroes of education. I'm your host Kwame Safa Mensa. If this is your first time tuning in to the podcast, we welcome you. We hope that you return for new episodes and future content. If you are a returning viewer or listener of the podcast, we welcome you back and we hope that today's episode is one that you find enlightening, informative, and insightful. So before we get into the festivities, I just ask you all to hit that red subscribe button if you're watching from YouTube so you can get notifications on new episodes and future content coming up. It's going to be under my name, Kwame Starfa Mensa, but this is the official Identity Talk for Educators Live channel where you're going to find episodes, replays, and all that good stuff. So hit that subscribe button so we can stay connected. Thank you kindly. All right, that's the announcement. Now let's get to the main event. Uh, today's episode is one that's going to be super black, <laughs> and that's how I like it. I like to keep it super black, uh, focus on my people, and we're going to begin to a variety of different topics from just black women in academia to Afrofuturism to black feminism, the whole nine. So there's a lot that we're going to be talking about in this short time. So to help me navigate through these topics, I want to bring on a sister who I've been following. Uh, She's a consultant, man. She's an activist. She's a professor, a former secondary school teacher. And guess what? I learned something today. They're actually black people in buffalo little did i know because <laughs> i have friends from buffalo and they all white so i'm like oh what we got a sister from buffalo 716 oh let's go so <laughs> let's bring on <laughs> our guest for today uh tiffany nishai to talk with us about her work and everything that she's doing so yeah let's get it in people <laughs> There's a lot of black people in Buffalo. The east side is all where all the black people at. You was probably in the suburbs. See, I listen, <laughs> listen. I only been to Buffalo once for my friend's wedding. Uh, shout out to Becky. So Becky and Nick, so the two good friends of mine, um, and they had their wedding. And like we were like only, I think we we're the only black couple there. But the wedding was popping. Yeah. I was like, okay, Buffalo, all right. <laughs> um. So now there's you. And then there's the Griselda. So, all right, those are the black people I know. <laughs> we gonna expand your horizons. Yes, yes, yes. Well, welcome to the podcast. It's great to finally meet you virtually in person. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm just excited to get into this conversation with you. So, how's everything been for you? Things are um, going good. You know, I just finished my first year at Penn State and trying to navigate that and all of my community stuff and the pandemic is going on and, you know, just trying to still stay connected to Buffalo. Thank God I'm only four hours away now because I've lived in Buffalo all my life, except for the past year. Still trying to stay connected and I've still able to do that but things are going well just trying to live harmoniously with everything that's going on Mm -hmm. awesome and let's start there so born and raised in buffalo let's take this time for you to tell us a little bit about yourself and what ultimately brought you into the education field yes i i think i have been teaching since i was a little girl like i used to tutor kids in the neighborhood (laughs) for for like, yeah, and I got made me a little money. I used to tutor some of the kids in the neighborhood and teach and work with, with students at my church, education initiatives and things like that. And I've always loved learning, especially with Black people and Black students and Black children and Black young people like myself. The main reason I came is because I think I always remember what it's like to be a young person. And I'm still goofy, but I was very goofy when I was younger. And I think I felt sometimes when I was a child that some adults took themselves a little too seriously and didn't know how to open up and have fun. Education is, was a place where I could have high expectations and teach our students the way I believe that they can be taught and, and help them. And, and not, I don't want to say help them, but pull out the brilliance that's already there, but still have joy and fun and, and be goofy and 
relatable and all of those types of things. Education is a place that I can do that. And I just can't get away from education. I'm always in it in some type of capacity. Um, so right, right. I'm always doing, working with some young people, teaching some young people or adults or, you know, and, and I love it. It's a very, education is a, is a creative space for me when I'm, a, if I'm in atmospheres that allow me to use my creativity, it can be a creative space for me. That's what brought me to education. And I also want to say, like, I grew up in Buffalo <laughs> on the East side of Buffalo um, black neighborhood, um, and grew up in a working class black church where small church where what they call storefront churches back then. Um, I don't know if there's too many of those now. And, um, my Sunday school teachers were black women who were very just wonderful. They just taught me so much and they, they pulled out all of my giftings and I didn't have, um, and I had a, my very first black male teacher in church, my uncle James, who wow. we used to not want to mess with uncle James because he was, well, he, well, the girls, he used to be not as hard on the girls. He used to be hard on my, on my boy cousins, <laughs> but, but he, he used to be strict. But when he was, when he taught this class, when I was like in at church, when I was like in um sixth and seventh grade, he was my Bible study teacher or something like that. And he was amazing. And I'm like, Uncle James, you missed your calling. You should have been a teacher, Uncle James. But he was so great. And so I always in my church world outside of school, I always had these black teachers. I always was positioned as being um, smart and I was able to write. And I wrote the, the Easter play at 10 years old and the adults in the church were like acting the play that I wrote. So that is what I wanted to bring in schools, with, you know, in education, because that's what I had outside of schools. <laughs> and I had some good teachers in schools, but, you know, that's what really kept brought, brought me to education. So I will say that I'll stop there. Wow. So the church really helped to cultivate your creativity and innovation, which you then were, was able to translate into the classroom. Absolutely. Absolutely. Translated. Um, and, and not being, we do need resources as classroom teachers, but I never, because I came from such a, a small church that didn't have a lot of resources and we did so much, I never let that stop me when I was a classroom teacher. So I, I never thought that there was nothing that I, I couldn't do, you know, and if I had a supportive principal at that, at those times, then that would make it better. But <laughs> Because wow. we get more support, but, you know, um, yeah. And I need to ask you this, and I didn't, and this is a curveball question, but just based on what you just said, right? Um, I know that when I was in the classroom, because I started my career in charter schools when I was in Philly, and in charter schools, you're operating as an independent entity. Yeah. So we didn't always have the textbooks we didn't always have the curricular framework. So this is like early 2010, around the time when Common Core was really starting to become popular nationwide. And um, all I got was just Common Core standards. And basically I spent the entire summer creating my own open sequence. Like I didn't have a script provided to me. I had to create that myself. So I started my first four years really being a supplementer scouring the internet, trying to yeah. find resources, creating projects from scratch, assignments, dittos, everything. Mm -hmm. And that was like my natural space. So then midway through my career, when I go into Boston Public Schools and I'm now teaching, I everything is given to me, scope of sequence and everything. And it felt weird to me. So I'm wondering from your perspective, because I know you were in Buffalo Public Schools for a good amount of time. Did you feel like, man, like I feel so constricted. Like, let me just do me. Well, actually, I started my career in a charter school as well. But it was oh, a wow. conversion charter school, Westminster Community Charter School, which was okay. what happened was it it was a public school in the 90s. So it was school, it was Buffalo Public School 68 in the mid-90s. Okay. And MT Bank got involved and wanted to change, um, wanted to change a school or do some educational initiative. 
And so they said they wouldn't get the worst school in Buffalo, but they'll get the second worst school in Buffalo. And at that time, 68 was the second worst school in Buffalo. They got an a awesome principal, Dr. Yvonne Minor Reagan from Chicago, recruited her. And they changed the school around over time. So I joined the staff around, was it 2006? I think 2006, I was a long-term sub. And then the next year I was a teacher. And at that time in 2006, that was right when, I think it was either that year or the year after that it moved completely to a charter school. So it was a conversion charter school, meaning that, um, but before that we still had a lot of free reign, but we still had to, our charter, we had to answer to the district for some things, but they didn't control our curriculum. And we... And as a teacher, I still was a part of the union, that this that the same union that the Buffalo Public School teachers were a part of, but we were still temporary po- employees, meaning that year by year we could be let go. I was never concerned about being let go, but so it was a it was a so that was I saw a lot with that experience. <laughs> you know, because sometimes we would be a part of the district, and then sometimes we wouldn't in the district. You know, they had a complicated re- relationship with us because we, you know, in some ways it's like you sit in your position like a traitor in a way and then in other ways you're not. So that was my, so to, to say that I had, I did have a lot of free reign at my charter school that I was in to the point that when I went to get my PhD after teaching for seven years and I was an instructional coach during that time and I was in a public school and I was working with a teacher and I was like, you know what? You're a two zone teacher. So let's move your classroom around because you, you teach like this, you do this whole group and then it's, so I'm helping her like move. So I go to, I'm about to move the classroom around, move a table or a file cabinet. She said, Oh, wait, 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 wait. You got to put an order in to move the table. I said, I said, what? I said, I got to put an order. I got to wow. ask somebody to move this file cabinet to here. Yeah. You got to, and I was like, oh, so this is what it's like working. <laughs> I was like, it was like, I I used to just, you know, I would get ideas and 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 the principal that I that I was up under in the beginning for the first, I would say for the first five years that I was at that school. If you were a higher a, a hardworking teacher and a teacher who was great with students, had a good teacher, she would support you like, and so I would be like. You know, I would just come. I remember once I was like, Dr. Reagan, I want to take, I want to do a Civil War exhibition on the whole first floor. And I want the third graders. That, like, I can't even believe, now that I think about it, I can't even, I was, you know, I can't even believe I just went to her and was like, can we just change the whole school day because I want to do, and she would be like, oh, okay, now you're going to have somebody doing this. You're going to have somebody watching this. Okay. Is so and so going to help you? Okay. And she would, you know, and so then when I went into public schools doing different things, I was like, this is really different, you know, and not mm-hmm. to say that everything is perfect um, in charter schools. Um, and we know charter schools are, so you got to go school by school because every school is like their own district. Absolutely. Um, you know, school by school. But, um, but yeah, that I didn't have those type of constraints. So that was different for me when I, yeah, you're absolutely right. And so it was very free, but sometimes there's other constraints. It may not be a scripted curriculum per se, But, you know, when you teach middle school, you know, I was a middle school teacher. You have to work as a team with y'all. You share students with eight other people. You know, you you share students with all of these other people. And when you work at the middle school level, I feel like you have more insight to what's happening in your school than a third grade teacher, per se, unless they run it differently because they kind of, you know, work with the third grade teachers. But you know, when you have meetings or something, you have to make decisions about this group of seven to eight graders. You're talking to like 12 different people almost, it seems like. And you yeah, all are, you know, you're thinking about what you're going to do, you know, the school trip to how do we want to discipline for this or whatever. And so that part, I'm going somewhere else, but I'm thank you for letting me talk. But I hope I'm not going too off with your question. Listen, but- no, listen, you, you're good. <laughs> We're going to go wherever you go. We go wherever destination you go. This is how the show flows. But I think, I think that 
you know, I really wanted, I, and I had good colleagues, but I think I wanted us to really, really work as a team around and really rally together around and not just to do graduation, not just to do class day or the class trip or whatever, but really rally around as a team because we're all responsible. And so, you know, and I did have literacy certifications and stuff. So I did do some literacy stuff sometimes, or sometimes when we were doing the Saturday school, Ooh, Lord. I would go and help with the ELA stuff, you know, do that. But I felt like, you know, we all had to rally around like ELA and math, but not everybody's not rallying around all the subjects, right? And I well, think we know that, why. What? What you say? We know why. Yeah, we know why. We know what, <laughs> why that is. But I also think if I'm going to, if I'm going to take up my time to support you because this students doing well in ELA and math benefits me as well, all of us, right? I think we should do that with each other. And I think sometimes, I think that when you work in schools, you're a teacher and you're a special teacher and you're a hardworking teacher and you really love these kids and you love the school, you know, it becomes your whole world and your whole life. And so it would be nice if the people that you worked with so closely, like I saw that meme that says, people you work with should be, teachers should be friends. You gotta be best friends, but like just, where you, and um, where we're all, I just don't think all the time, this is what I will say, because I didn't have horrible colleagues, but I don't think we, all of us always had the student's best interest in mind. Mm. And maybe, and maybe that's because you got some racism stuff you need to work on. <laughs> maybe because you, you a control freak, you know, maybe it's because it's, it's a lot of reasons and may, or maybe because you don't understand, you don't come from a liberation perspective of how kids can be educated in ways where we're not trying to force them to be something. We're just trying to cultivate what it's already in them, you know, and some people teach that way. So I think that part can be constraining sometimes. It can be disheartening. It can be like, I was very hungry for, I wanted to learn. I wanted to do better. I wanted to do, I just wanted to that, you know, and that's why I do a lot of the stuff that I do because I, I'm thinking about teachers who were like me. I was just so hungry to learn. Like if I had an opportunity to be going to even NCTE or whatever, I would have ate that stuff up. And I think that everybody's not like that. And so it can, if you're that type of teacher and you understand your work as community work, which is my Black feminist pedagogy coming up, but like yeah. that that community work, that it's, it's activism, teaching, you're looking at them in all their intersections then it doesn't turn off for you when you leave that that school in that classroom. And so when you don't work with people, the majority of people that you have to work closely with to make decisions about these beautiful Black children, because my students were all Black, just about. I only had two white students at that school. It makes it difficult and it's constraining and you're always the one saying stuff and you're always... And so, you know, I just wish I would have known to... I ha would have had outlets to build community because around that type of stuff, because I didn't have that type of community completely in the middle school level. Now, there were some black teachers in other places where we would talk and we would organize and do stuff, you know. But when we're rallying around these young people, you know, um, I think that's important. No, I agree. Now, I, I want to go back a little bit because you spoke about the importance of having synergy with your teacher colleagues, your grade level team, right? In your opinion, do you believe that the high stakes standardized testing era has caused teachers to be competitive amongst each other? And I'm only asking this because I believe that because the way our students perform on these tests plays a role in how we get evaluated, mm -hmm. it causes some teachers to be in their own shell, if you will, and not be as collaborative and as open to sharing, you know, resources and, and different things. So I'm just interested in your take on that. Yeah, I do think that that's absolutely. I mean, of course, that that is going to cause people to be more comfortable. I don't think we were that bad. Like, I, I just think we could have done better. I don't want to paint, you know, that school, that my teaching experience as like where people were just shutting their doors and of course, right. I, I only care about my score. And I know there are schools like that. So my school, it wasn't like to that degree, but it does make you more competitive or it does make you only rally around the, the high stakes test, right? So we can collaborate and work together just around the ELA test or the math test, right? 
Right. Which most of us ain't that helpful with the math anyway. So, unless he's a math teacher, you, you know, but I'd be mean, like, um, you know, we can rally around that. But instead of seeing like how, you know, these subjects are, are across all subjects. And so, how do we rally and how do we rally around other things and not just the test? Like you said, you know, it does make you competitive. It makes you what you should be concerned about mm, as regards sorry. our babies, our children. It really narrows, it's so limiting in what it means to educate and what we care about, what we attend to and the parts of our students that we attend to and the parts of our school culture that we attend to when we're, when we're solely focused on tests. You know, it, it's so limiting. And so that that's what I think. And yes, it can be a competitive. I remember I had one colleague, and I he might be listening to this, but it's all love. But I gotta tell on you because this is important. But um, I won't say his name, but he know who he is. But um, he he was older than me, so he was a science teacher and mm -hmm. black male, always treated me like a little sister that he was helping when I first started teaching. And so this one time I was teaching my social studies class and his science test was coming up where well, they were taking the bio, the high school test. So they were eighth graders taking the biology test. So this was a big deal. And I was teaching my class and he just came in. I don't know if it was like the middle or the end or just like, okay, well, this ain't important. Y'all done with this. Come, come, come on. Cause we got to get ready for our test or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I went to talk to him about it. And I, I was, I had to be only a year or two in. So highly. Oh, wow. You're a I'm baby. Anyway, but, <laughs> but so I was, I was like, and I don't appreciate how you did that. Did that. And I started crying. He was like, I'm so sorry. I didn't even notice I was doing that. <laughs> I'm like, you just act like my class is not even important. And if I wasn't teaching them this, that, the other, because you know, I was teaching literacy in there and you know, I was teaching writing too. Okay. <laughs> if I wasn't doing all of this, da, 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 da. and so I think like sometimes people are not even aware of what tests do to them that it affects relationships. And then when you say that you're making student, you know, it just it just makes us not attend to everything that's important. That's what I'll say. I totally agree with all that. So you tell me all these wonderful stories about your time in the classroom, but then you ultimately make the transition to academia. So I'm interested in knowing what motivated you to make that transition and how's it been for you? <laughs> I really wish I would have said this in my exit interview. I didn't tell the truth in my exit interview. And I really wish when I left the classroom, I had told the truth. I, I was, I glazed over and I just said, oh, I'm just going to get my PhD. But I hope I could be real on your show because I left the classroom because a principal that I had at the time, and going back to your point about um, this principal came in and was really all about test scores. Look, you know, just came in with a certain air, went to, a, I think that's a Ivy League, went to an Ivy League school, came in very arrogant, condescending, and basically, and, and really had an intimidation approach if you didn't kiss up to this person or whatever. And so at first I thought, I was like, like I told you before, I really like to learn. So I was like, maybe it's something I can improve. I want to do, you know, do well. So at first he was telling me to do this type of stuff and, you know, switch some things. And some stuff was, I found helpful. So I was switching some things when I was teaching. Then he asked one of my students to come I'm in the hallway doing an activity, a survey or something with the students for the industrial revolution. I think I'm about to learn about. And he asked one of my students to come over to come here while he was walking through the hall with some people. And my student came up to me and was like, uh, Miss Neatri, he said he wants to see you in his office after school. And I'm like, uh, okay. So I go into his office and he's like, um, how long did it take you? to make that lesson that you were doing. Did you spend a lot of time on that? Like you spent on the last one that you were doing, the last unit? And I was like, yeah, I did. I spent a lot of time on it. I was like, no, you did it. What? And <laughs> this, and he basically just goes on the line about how it was a horrible lesson. Now he walked by for five, two, like five seconds. And that I didn't work as hard. Mind you, just like a week before Christmas break. Okay. But anyway, <laughs> I need to redo the whole thing. 
you know, I didn't really know what I was doing. Now, at this time, I have been, at this point, I had been a celebrated teacher. I'm not a new teacher. I'm a teacher who has received a lot of accolades, who have done very well. Not that I was perfect. I will never come on here and act like I was perfect. But I knew what I was doing. And I left out of there. I walked out of the room and I tried to leave real quick because I could feel my tears ri rising up. Like, just berating me. Not like yelling, but tearing me down, right? Crazy. And so I walked out. I tried to hurry up and walk out because I felt my tears coming. I was not about to cry in front of this dude. I was not. So I was like, hey, let me just hurry up and get out of here. So he follows me. I think at that moment he knew he kind of went too far. So he follows me a little bit. Oh, I think you're a good teacher. I think you're a good teacher. And I'm like, okay, whatever. So I get in the car. I get home. My husband, Nanducey, Deuce, picks me up. And I get in the car and I like bust out crying. And he's like, what is going on? What's wrong with you? I was like, I don't want to, I don't know if I should be a teacher. I don't want to teach no more. I just, he was like, what happened? I've never seen you leave this school upset like this. You have never, like, what happened? Right. And so at that point, and then it was like, this is a layered thing. All of the people who we had worked with before, because of fear, I'm going to give them credit. I'm going to say because of fear. Everybody was just acting brand new. Now, I've been working with y'all for the past almost seven years. Just acting brand new because this new guy came around, you know, and people trying to get up under him. You know how people do when it's administrator, everybody's scared of, then they want to, some of us, not all of us, but some people want to kiss their butt and be all like, mm, don't yeah. fire me. I wasn't doing all that. So I, I just pulled away. I never went and talked to him again, ever. And I said, I got to get up out of here. I know I've been talking about getting a PhD, but I got to get up because if I stay here at this school, I'm never going to want to be in education again. Like, wow. I got to get up out of here. So I started making, I, would, I never talked to him. I never went into his office for help. And he knew it because every time you see me, he's like, hey. like, oh, you got the wrong one. You thought I was going to be one of these teachers. I was going to be like, huh? okay, what do you want? I was like, oh, that's, and I, you know, and I was done. And I started to make moves to get into my PhD program. I started to, and I just kind of, kind of, after a while, just got a little checked out that year. That was my last year in the classroom. It, was, it wasn't my favorite, but I kind of checked out a little bit because I just couldn't believe. Then at one point they was taking my students and out of my class for a whole marking period to get math prep. What? And, and then, yes, took my out of my class for a whole marking period to get math prep. And then when it was time for grades to be due, they told me to put in the math IIS. You know, I'm just going to spill all the tea because this going to bless somebody because I want to tell y'all about no, these please do. Keep, tell it all this tea, Keep it 100. Keep it 100. Come then on. Then wanted me to take the grade that they received for AIS and put it in my social studies grade on their report card. Wow. Wow. And, and then um, told me that that's what I was supposed to do. I refused to do it because you know what I had just remembered in my mind? I remember those teachers in Atlanta who got arrested for changing grades, which they probably did for the test. Remember them teachers? They, them oh, guys, yeah. There's a whole documentary about that. Whole documentary. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like, hmm, let me think about this. Because if this ever, I'm going to be the one that, okay. So I went right up to him and, and the person who was his little assistant at that time. I'm going to leave it at that. I said, excuse me, in the hallway, they're in dismissal. Are you asking me to put a grade by my name that I didn't give? And I just stared at him. Let me show you how you do these people. You just stare. He said, oh, well, oh, well, you you benefit too from the math grade. You made it from the math test scores. You, you, the whole school benefits from the math test scores. I said, mm -hmm. but you're asking, I just want to be clear. You're asking me to put a grade with my name by it that I didn't give next to, that's what you asked me to do for all these students. No, no, no. I wow. said, oh, oh, I won't be doing that. I said, I will not be doing that because that's, I'm not putting a grade that I didn't give. And on those babies report card for that market period, they didn't have no social studies grade. That is crazy. And, and the funny thing is, well, not really funny, but I've been in similar situations like that before where a child is clearly failing my class, 
haven't been doing homework, uh, they're missing assignments. You're going through your procedures as you should. You're calling parents, you're notifying them in advance, you're being proactive and everything, leaving the paper trail because you know documentation is always key, mm-hmm. always have that running record. And then, end of term happens, you put the grades into this computer system. So that's what I had in my one of my old schools. And the principal goes in and changes the grades that you put in and turns them to passing grades oh. without even notifying you. And I'm like, well, hold up. Really? But it's things like that that causes you not to be able to build trust yeah. with your school leader. Like if you want to find a way to burn the bridge, that's yeah. a good way to do that. So everything that you're saying, like I feel you to the core. And I'm yeah, and I'm thankful and that like, you even shared that. And it's like, I want teachers to be aware of this because do not fear. We're so feared in YouTube. Because let me tell you something. If something come out, you going down, baby. They not going down. For real. You going down and you have to have, all you have is your name. All you have is your integrity. If you don't stay true to what you believe and what you know to be right, because these people will... There's the there's a crowd that's gonna follow whoever the new principal is, and they become total. I was really shocked, like being with a principal, one principal for five years, and most of my colleagues for five years, and then seeing this total change. And then in my, tw- I was like, who are who are you? That's why I love your teacher identity work, and I love it so much. I love it, love it, love it because. That's what's missing. You have to know who you are. You have to, you don't have to know completely because especially when you first start out, but if something don't feel right to you, don't, don't do it. It's right. You probably right. Like, because these people will throw you up under the bus and now you don't get to do what you love. And now they missing out a teacher, probably one of the few, a few teachers who really love them and care about them because you up here scared of these people. Let me tell you something. What you and you gotta know they're not gonna admit that they made you do that. So how they gonna get you? How you gonna get in trouble? Exactly. Exactly. You know, like, they can't. Like, are they gonna admit? Are they gonna admit? They ain't say nothing to me for the rest of the year after I said that. I looked them dead in their face. Like, oh, this look like and almost look a little dumb. Are you asking me to put? A... <laughs> oh. And use the actual tone. Like, are you asking me to are actually you do asking that? me to make one <laughs> that I didn't give? Yeah, don't come through with that sister voice now. But then there'd be more problems, you know. Sometimes like, they need that too. But I'm like, I'm no. like, you got to, you got to, and that okay. My story, my answers be so long. I, you know what I mean? like, it gets in here, long answers. But to say that is how I wound up in a PhD program. I didn't even know about being a professor. I'm telling you, I'm a girl from the east side of Buffalo. I never, you know, I was a hard worker in school, but I never was like, did, I never like did good on standardized tests and all of that. Like, you know, I'm just, you know, and I didn't even know about higher ed and all that. I really can't even believe I'm at this thing. <laughs> like, I just, I just happenstance, like, I got pissed off at my principal. I was I'm going to get a PhD program. Okay, literacy. And then I opened up a whole world for me and and it's going really well for me. I have more freedom. I do really miss the classroom and I miss it so bad that before the pandemic, I would always do um, summer social justice literacy workshops in the summer with different organizations with you just so I could be teaching you. Um, and That's all of my research, I actually facilitate and research at the same time. So I'm, you know, I'm usually teaching the thing or running the thing and then researching too because I love the work. I love the, I love being with students. I love, you know, they just so, they just so dope. Like they just, everything they? They used to get me together. I don't even know how to dress no more. Cause I don't got my middle school. They used to be telling me, miss, come here. Uh-uh, take that off. Cause I was like, okay, now what do I wear? Okay. Thank you, girl. You know, they, they keep you, they keep you together, but you know, um, and that's how I, that's how I wound up. And so I do like the freedom. I do miss classrooms. I'm, I miss designing a classroom i miss I, I i really mourned that i didn't realize how much i mourned that you don't get to do that as a college professor where you can have a bulletin board which is the work and you know have your little carpet area and you just create a whole atmosphere as the backdrop of the learning 
And I really mourn that part of teaching mm. a lot. Um, so, but I love it. I love what I'm doing. I love the freedom that I have. I love that I get to be involved in education in a lot of different ways. And I love that I get to craft what I want my career to look like, even at a research institution. You know, I don't have to just only write articles and, and even though that's important and some people want to do that, but that wouldn't be fulfilling enough for me. And so I get to craft and I'm very intentional about that. And that's different. A lot of people, you know, people, that's not the norm. There's more of us doing stuff like that, but that's not the norm. And so right. I love that I get to craft what I want my career to look like. What I, man, not just career, but my work, what I want my work to look like, you know, and I, and I like that. So my long answer is. That, that's awesome. And not everybody has that autonomy to make those decisions. So let's stay on academia for a second. And one of the dope things about this podcast is I've had the opportunity to interview a lot of black women in academia, you know, black women who are professors yep. who have had to work hard to get to their position. So I'm interested in knowing from you as a black woman in academia, what was your journey like to get to professorship and what were some of the ups and downs that you experienced? And I think it's important to ask this question because we have a lot of black women who are trying to pursue what you did and want to engage in the work that you're doing. So if you could just share a little bit about your journey. I think I'm going to add in that when, when I respond to this, it's also the intersections of, my being black being woman and coming from a working class background yes where i don't i didn't have a lot of the um pedigree that a lot of people have when they come into these programs okay and so i really worked very hard to learn things i really had to connect to this at the time is you know the universe now i didn't even know about you know, like, oh, I could have went to UCLA for my PhD. I just said, I'm pissed off at this school. And I went down the street to wherever I could get my PhD, <laughs> which was the University at Buffalo, okay? But I didn't even know about the whole world of, like, I could have applied to this program or this program, you know, or you look up a scholar that you like, right? And then you go and see if you can study up under them or whatever. So I just went down the street. And so there, I, I did have support. I had a great advisor. She was a black woman and I had another mentor who really rallied around me and, and supported me, but I still needed more than my program was offering like critical conversations was not really a part of the program. And so one thing that I did and I did use some of my student loan job, we just going to keep it real, <laughs> but it shaped my <laughs> career. <laughs> it did shape my career. I did go to a lot of conferences as a doc student. And I'm going to tell you right now, someone who didn't come from a particular pedigree, didn't understand academia at all, like the way you got to understand it, PhD, like <laughs> doctoral program, like at all. Um, if it wasn't for me going to conference and connecting with particular people, I would not, I would not be where I am. If it wasn't for Black women who I met at conferences who saw me and, at, and said hello to me and said, hi, how you doing? What's your name? Right? <laughs> and then put me on the stuff like, oh, you should get in this program. You should do this fellowship program or come to my session and, and learn all of this. And Nate, when I tell you Black women that were not at the university I was at, when I was a doc student, rallied around me and I would not be. I mean, I got a name 20. I got day 20 just off the top of my head. Like, and I really did not. He's like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm just here. Da, 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 da. Got me together with the, the hidden curriculum of the PhD. And you know, I do, I do, I have had to work very hard, you know, like all black women have to work hard and also like to to understand the hidden curriculum of the academy. And I did go through some very, you know, it's hard when you're in a PhD program and what do I want to say? You're taking classes with people that are not paying attention to, just are just not anti-conscious. They're not so, into the work. 
they're not into the work. They don't get it. They're not woke. Right. If we still saying that they not really anti-racist and all that, that we say now. And so it's a lot of stuff that happens. It's a lot of microaggressions that happens. And a lot of these professors don't know how to tend to, how to, how to have an atmosphere where we're respecting everybody. And then your black students and black women students are, or other students of color are being harmed, you know? And so I did go through some things with, um, with professor, professors who thought they know more about black people than I do because you research black people for 30 years, even though you're white. Okay. Um, <laughs> professors that, you know, would let certain things happen in class that they should have intervened because it was really toxic. It was really anti-black. I ain't gonna even say what it's, I'm gonna say it was just straight up anti-black stuff happening. And, and it's hard sometimes when you're always the one that has to speak up. And that when you are an activist, plus like there's some people, even black people, black women who they just say, I'm just getting this and they going through. And then some of us, this, you know, we're also activists. We also are on the ground in other ways. And so we can't sit in class in a dot class and just let certain stuff go and not say nothing. Right. You know? Right. But that's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of things to think about. And so going to conferences really helped me to find a nice community. I have like some of my closest friends that I've met through being in a doctoral program at conferences and connecting with people. Not, you know, and, um, and that's, and, you know, and so that's how I got through it. And my two mentors who were there find you, even if you just got one, find you one to two people that can support you where you're at. And I will also say like my advisor, we have like similar values, but we're different in, the, in a lot of ways. And she didn't try to change me. She didn't try to control me. And I really thank her for that. Like she never was like, you want to do what? You can't do that mm. and work at a research university. She used to be like, um, okay, Tiffany, well, um, <laughs> I to this and, this and, this. and I went to them and said, she was like, one time I went mad about some class and she said, well, Tiffany, okay, don't drop the class, okay? Like she'd be trying to help me not like jump up like all oh, these people. But, you know, I do think, um, but you got to put that work in. Like I'm, I tell people this all the time. If you want to get a PhD, just so that you can have letters behind your name, this ain't it. Wow, and this I'm glad. It. Yeah, that yeah, it, it's it's funny you mentioned that because I actually applied to a doctoral program. It was an EDD program through uh, Northeastern University in Boston. I actually got into the program, but then I had to reevaluate why I was even doing it in the first place. Yes, and then when I realized, nah, I'm not doing it for the right reasons. Like, I just never went because I knew that mm, I don't think this is for me. Yeah. And the program is awesome. It's a great program. I just knew that in my heart. I didn't have the right mindset or even the stamina to even go through this program, you know, at this stage, you know, being a father and, and then a, a husband. So there are some things I had to consider. But what I'm interested in knowing is, and you talked about this a little bit, because there are a lot of black women in academia who end up being forced out because at some point it really has a negative impact on your self care. So, a perfect example, sister uh, Odina Simmons of the Yale mm -hmm. ends up walking out of that job because it just got to be too much. And she realized that there was so much racial trauma yep. that was yep. building up just through her doing what you're doing, just being an activist, always speaking up, yeah. you know, always trying to disrupt and dismantle. So I'm wondering for black women who are where you are in academia, how do they succumb to, how do they do the work without succumbing to racial bad fatigue? Because that's a huge thing that goes on in the world. That's a wonderful question. You know, you, you have to take care of yourself and you have to ask yourself, you can't do everything either. Right. So when people ask you to do stuff, try to do as we, like with me, I really work very, very hard. And I'm not saying I do it good all the time, but I work very hard to only do service and extra stuff that really align with things that bring me joy, with things that I care about. 
And just because I do social justice work don't mean that I do all social justice work. You understand what I'm saying? Come on. Come on. Speak just that. Because, just because I do uh, stuff with black girls is not, or anti-racism, sometimes a racial literacy stuff. I'm not jumping on every diversity committee. Come on. I'm not jumping on every little thing that they ask me to do. Because here's the thing, too. So here's some tests that I do. If I come to one meeting, even if it's other people of color there, and I'm the only one saying something about this, saying something about this, saying something about that, and I'm the only one saying something, that's not the service position for me. Because mm. I'm not about to be doing fight, doing all of that fight by myself. So another problem is we got to move in collectives. We're so individualistic. And I know it's the academy that does it to us. But if you're doing everything by yourself, you're going to burn out. Especially you doing this, this type of, if you do any type of diversity, equity, whatever you want to call it, justice, anti-racism, and you doing this stuff by yourself, you're going to burn out. And so I, I have a lot of different groups that I, you know, that, I, that I'm fueled and I fuel because it's not just about me getting, but giving as well. We refuel each other. I have to look at my health too. Like, am I, this is another thing. You got to sleep. I, it's, people, you know, you be looking Come at on. people and they be publishing every, every week. They got a new publication. Don't compare yourself to them because you know what? Some of these people ain't sleeping. Some of these people on uppers. They they trying to get that they trying to go down that ten year track they they trying yeah, they to secure try, that ten year that's why they running like crazy Tiffany gonna go to sleep at night <laughs> Tiffany gonna go to sleep at night Tiffany gonna watch her shows and her downtime I, I watch my shows now come on now because you can't stay you can't you can't do that you will lose your mind and you will and you will you don't want to be you don't want to be so people can't talk to you people can't come up to you and do all that we can never control what white people do. In these institutions. I'm going to say that again. We can't control what white people do, but what we can do is we can decide what we're going to engage in and what we're not going to engage in. Come on. And we can nip stuff in the bud in the, like, I'm I'm a person that people really get along with. Okay? I can see why. <laughs> Even white people. Right? <laughs> I'm a person. Until, you know, until I have to let you know then you're like, I thought Tiffany was so nice. You thought I was nice to the point that you just going to say whatever. I'm very professional and tactful, but I'm going to address stuff when it happens because I want you to know right away that this is not okay. Now, am I going to be arguing every little thing? Yes, we do have to pick our battles. You can't take on every battles. You can't do every single committee. And don't get impressed when people pump you up. Like, you're so great. You're so... Da -da 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 -da, and so they can get you to do stuff. Don't get caught up in that. Mm. Don't don't even get caught in there. You know you great. That's Look at date. yourself in the mirror. Tell yourself you great and you smart and all that. You don't need them to tell you you great and smart. Okay? Uh, and you're yeah. not here to do... And you got to make sure... You got to really ask yourself what... Just like people will ask me to do things like... I am very particular. I'm not saying that it'll always happen. But I have to work very hard. If any extra thing that I'm going to do, I got to be around people of color. If you want me to do some extra anti-racist thing or da, 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 I'm going to be working with white teachers who are the students, mostly students of color. Like, I got to know what's getting to the baby. You know, I got to be some type of way because I can't sustain myself with that. And um, and it's, and it's like, you have to be, you have to really protect your spirit. Like, you really do. And you, you, you can't always put yourself in these situations and we don't have to be in some of it and some of it is hard because we we want to be liked we're oppressed peoples you know we've worked very hard to get where we are and so sometimes it's our desire to be like or to be the expert or to listen stop trying to do everything too because i'll call my homies up be like listen this somebody asked me to do this this ain't my expertise but i know you my, my home girl Farima called me the other day. Tip, they asked me to do something with like anti-racism literacy. I don't do that. Here you go. Pass stuff around. That's another thing. We be nice. trying to do everything. It's so competitive. We don't move collectively. We don't even think about who are your friends that you, you know, why do you have to do, do you have to do everything? 
Is there somebody else that you know that could do this? You know, do you have to do it? I don't have to. I don't have to do everything. I don't have to be the only the one called on for everything because I'm trying to walk in my purpose. That's another reason why, too. You have to be and it's hard. And we keep, and I'm not saying this is easy, no, but it's you not. have to really sit with yourself and repeatedly. My mother gets on me about this because I'll start to be like, mom, this is going wrong. And then should I still be doing this? She was like, uh, you can't be doing this every time something happens now. You supposed to do it. It's just, you know, but I do think that I do think like it is about being very clear about your values and what you're doing. And when you get clear about that. So like I have certain things that I do. I know I have my three, four lines of things that I do. When people ask me to do things, I'm looking about how those benefit those lines. If it don't, I'm not doing it. And I can recommend you to somebody else. So we can't do everything. We have to take care of ourselves. We have to sleep. We have to work out. I'm not saying you got to be skinny, but you know, I used to be an athlete. So I'm trying to get back to the track days, but that's just me. That's just me. But I, you know, but, but you ain't got to do that. I'm not body shape with nobody, but you know, but I'm saying like, you know, we gotta, we gotta watch our health. We have to watch, um, moving, moving our bodies we have to do things that bring us joy you cannot just do this job all the time and you know i'm going to train your i'm going to tenure track there's things that i have to do differently there's i have to be organized in certain ways so that i'm doing being you know what i need to do but i'm also building in ways to um to take care of myself and do things that bring me joy and for me i have to be around non-academic folks because if like that's what I'm raised up in. And I, that's what that's what fill my soul. I can't just, I just can't do the academic stuff all the time. That, that should, but I love it. Like I really love my job. I love research. And I you see my library. I read all day. But that I can't only have that type of space. And um, and so you need to keep and don't compare yourself to people. It's hard. Mm. It's very hard. And I think that's our problem. Like we compare this person to us. Well, I I need to do that. Too. Like people be like, even people say it to me, you doing this, that, and the other. Oh, wow. don't look at me like that because you don't know what it costs for me to do what I do. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you, know? you don't know. And you don't know what it costs for this other person to do what they got, what they do. Right. And so, and so you don't, you may not want that. So don't, don't envy people. Don't, don't compare yourself to people. Like do your journey, do your thing. And just keep it moving. And 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 it, and it is frustrating. It is, you know, I ain't gonna lie. Sometimes it get frustrating when people ain't, you know, hyping you up. Like they hyping this other person. And they don't even really do that research. I, I was doing that in 88. But, you know, you know, but, you know, it do. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, that, that happens though. No, yo, you are not lying. That does happen. There are people who just write just to write. And then you wonder... Are you really about that work or are you just a scholar who just reads about it and and just, you know, disseminates information about it? Just trying to get ahead. You just right. doing whatever you got to do to get ahead. And, and I'm telling you, these people be on Ambien. These people be on, like you. You think you want that life? You go ahead. These people don't sleep. Not all of them. Yeah. I'm not saying everybody, but I'm like, like, don't just don't compare yourself because you never know what people are doing. To do what they do, and maybe you don't want to do that. I don't. Some stuff I don't want to do that. Yeah, and it's like, as someone who writes blogs and stuff, like it takes me a minute just to get that blog together, and that's blogs, only five hundred to seven hundred no words. Joke. No blogs ain't no joke because you have to be so succinct, succinct and clear. It got to be powerful, but it got to be clear, and it exactly. got to be like you don't got no whole time to explain yourself, and then we get to the end and be like, oh, that's what's the point. No, you got to be. Yes, it's a different type of writing. But with regard to publications, you have, you know, your liter literature review, your abstract, all these different components. You're talking about a 20 to 40 page document. And you have people who are producing that on a weekly basis. And I'm thinking to myself, where do you have the time to even have that brain power to produce all these publications? at such a frequent basis, like where's the time? Do you have a family? Do you have children? How are you able to do that at that pace? Mm -hmm. And even if you don't have children, it's it's just, you just can't, 
it's unsustainable even if you're a single person like it's just you can't and i'm not i'm not hating on people who if you have figured out how to work like that and be healthy and be well-rounded and live harmoniously write a book baby and teach rest the rest of us you know so i don't want to assume that people are not but you know, I just think like, like you were talking about like this competition and it's, it's competitive and people are worried about this, that, and the other. Um, I'm trying to follow my path. Oh, this is the other thing I want to say to your other question about, you know, what do I do? Get a mentor. Oh, I always, let me tell you something. I'm going to be signing up a mentorship when I'm 70 years old. Okay. I always be, I'll be signed. I'll be like, is that mentorship program? I'll be signing up. Okay. So I'll be <laughs> <laughs> like, I do. I, if I if I get in, I get in, but I be listen, you got to get mentors, get your peer, peer to peer where people you have your good group. Now, some of us don't have good groups because we're not good friends to people. Mm. Okay. So let's 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 have a talk with ourselves too about that. So if you want to have a community and a collective, you you also got to be good to people and then people want to okay. Uh, that's all I'm gonna say about that. All right. So I want to switch gears here because I want to give you a chance to talk about the Evolving Education Project. So your baby, right? And you mentioned that, you know, you want to be focused on your work. You want to have the autonomy to do the work that you want to do. And Evolving Education Project, it pretty much falls in line with what you've been saying. So tell us about what inspired you to start the project and what's the mission of it. And, and I have to say this, the website is one of the dopest websites I've ever seen. Like, whoever is your graphic designer, whoever is your website developer, kudos to them because- Tiffany Stubbs I'm, of Dogma Design, black woman dope out of Atlanta, Dogma Design. Oh my goodness. Like, it's colorful, it's aesthetically pleasing, and then just the graphics. Yeah, I was just blown away by it. So yeah. I wanted to put that out there, but please go ahead and answer the question. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Kwame. Um, wow. Okay, I'm gonna try not to, you know I'll be having these super long answers, but <laughs> I always tell a story, but it's real quick. So when oh. I was when I was always wanted to be a teacher, my father used to be like, You're so talented, you could be in theater. You don't, why don't you do something else? Why don't you do communications? Or why don't you do this or that? He he wanted me to be the next Oprah Winfrey and all of this. And I was like, I, I was like, Dad, I use all of those giftings as a classroom teacher. I be dancing, I be flipping, I be singing songs. I do everything as a classroom teacher, right? <laughs> but I, I'm proud of this because I'm finally using my communication skills that my dad wanted me to. So I will say that. But um no, um, I, I, okay, so I love reading and believe it or not, the more you become, the, the more you get into the academy, the less time reading that you do and education books. I love reading education books and I love, I'm always having a conversation with them about it, mm. um, in my head. And so I wanted to have this space where I could do that, but also connected to work, like where people are actually doing the ideas in the book on the ground. And um, and then just have a fun, you know, I like to hang out and just chit chat. So the first part of every series is the gathering where we just talk about the theme and then we have the book interview and then we show where it's at in, in, in happening in a world where people on the ground really doing these ideas that are in this book. And what our main thing is that we center the educational joys, passions, interests, and inquiries of people of color. And I'm very, and the reason why I say that, and I say that a lot on everything you see with it, because like, I love the support from, from, from white people who, white folks, even some of my friends who are white, who support the podcast, but we are not doing this to teach white people how to, they're not centered here. Right. This is about what people of color care about, okay? Um, you know, doing all of this social justice stuff and even teacher professional development stuff like I do, I just feel like white people are always centered in conversations when it comes to um, people of color. It's always how do we help them get it? How do we help them understand? 
How do we? And I just didn't want to do that. Now, could they learn from this? Yes. But I wanted to be um space. And I also wanted to, I also wanted to create something. You know, when you go, get into the academy and you come from such a like grassroots background, you know, where you're like always with people in communities. I just feel like, um, you know, I wanted to make these conversations accessible to all types of educators, not just people, you know, and you know, you write your article, you know, I ain't do all this work for 12 people to read it. <laughs> you know, like exactly. at least, you know, with your blogs, you getting a lot more people to read your stuff, you know. So I think, and I also think like when I I'm gonna tell you this, like when I go anywhere, if I okay, so we're gonna go back to Buffalo. So if I'm in Buffalo and I go into, you know, black owned businesses on in, you know, on the east side of Buffalo and everything, and people who know me, because I was raised there, you know, walking around Buffalo, they'll they they want to they be talking to me about no matter what they bet, they be asked about education, about Black Lives Matter, activism, all of the stuff they want to talk about. And it just, and you know, even my aunts who were educators, maybe they didn't have degrees or whatever. But they were educators, and I think there's a lot of people educating our children that would like to be a part of these conversations or hear these conversations. And so I also wanted to make these conversations more accessible to all educators, you regardless if you're in schools, if you're in an after-school program, if you are in a non-profit and you work with these this group of five black boys in the the program for them, you know, whatever, you know, I think, I think that there are a lot of people who are interested in these conversations, who are investing in our youth and who want to know these conversations. Because whenever I run into people who are not in education, but they care about kids of color, they be talking to me for like a whole hour about something I posted. And I'll be like, when did I post that? You know, whatever. So I think it's a lot of people who care. We want to make it accessible and I want to do better. It's not transcribed or anything. So I know it's not accessible to deaf folks. So I want to work on that, but I do think, but that stuff costs money. So I just, you know, as you know, I'm sure Kwame, all that stuff costs money. <laughs> so we have to work on that. But I do think making that, comp you know, that's what inspired me. And also because I keep going back to when I was a classroom teacher and how I wanted to learn and if I had had a resource like this, or even your podcast, if I had had stuff like this when I was a classroom teacher, it would have helped me so much. I wouldn't have felt so isolated and alone. I would have, you know, I maybe I would have stayed, maybe not, or maybe I would have at least stayed through my PhD program. You right. Know, I was hungry for that type, for these type. I would be, buy, I would have bought these books. I would have had them all of this time. And, and I just, I'm looking for teachers like that, teachers who are, or educators who want to hear they care about these conversations and and also i want to uplift teachers i hate i did so much stuff as a classroom teacher i mean so much stuff and i didn't start getting like noticed or popular credit so i got out of the classroom and you know we just don't celebrate teachers like they be doing so much stuff they be you know flipping on their heads and doing all of this stuff and turn this stuff around for kids and we don't celebrate so also a place like that, but also not just classroom teachers, but non-traditional educators because education yes. does not happen just in schools and classrooms, right? And so non-traditional educators. And so that's something, and I hope, and I also want it to be a place. I say this at the end of every episode, but um, hopefully in a couple of years, if people, it'll catch on. But I really want it to be a place where people feel like this is their podcast and they can write in and say, we want y'all to, we want to hear about this and we could be like, okay, I want that to happen. And I hope that, you know, or I, we really love this book. Can you, you know, see if you can get an interview with this person or I love this group and could you, I wanted to become the, you know, educators of all and parents and families and communities of color, their podcast uh, that they can shape and direct around education. And I hope that happens. But that's what I want. Um, and that's that that's why it's there. And I get to use more of my gifting. That's I sound so church saying gifting. <laughs> I get I give myself away every time. My gifting. But my my gifts and my talents and my creativity that I just can't even use in the academy hardly. So I just be like <laughs> Yeah. But I think that is that's just all dope because I look at some of the work that 
you know, a lot of, you know, the academics are doing now to try to redefine what yeah. it means to be in that scholarship. So you mentioned Dr. Farima. Oh, yeah. And, and she's somebody who I love. She's actually someone who, you know, I've asked to come on. So I know it's going to happen. Yeah. It's going to happen Farima in the future. Yeah. Yes. I, will, I will tell her too. But I know. <laughs> Stephanie yeah, Howard. but I also know that you know there've been some personal things going on, so yeah, I know yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, so I know it's going to happen. I always pick with her. There's yeah, no but <laughs> just dope people. Her, uh, you know, I've had a uh, Dr. Angel Jones. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so like there are a lot of just black women. Dr. Yolanda Celia Ruiz, that's yep. like my sister, one yep. of my north stars. So, but see, that's but for you to say that that was my example. So these these are who when I came into the doc program, this is who I had as an example: Marcel Haddix. I don't know if you know her. Goldie Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yoli, Dr. Yolanda Celia Ruiz. Yep. And they was just walking around, just doing their own thing, like, and I was just like. These ladies just like they're so, they so chill too. They're they they're just so, so down to earth. You they forget that they're they're in that space. They are the ones that embraced me. They took me up under, and they just and they do. They've done this for a lot of people. And together, individually, you see them somewhere. Uh, Valerie Kinlock, Dean Valerie Kinlock, the dean of uh, the I think it's the College of Education. I think in Pittsburgh, right? Pittsburgh. Yep. Her, you know, like they just even Bettina. I know Bettina is a big name, but Bettina is good on one on one. Like she, she is a big name, but she doing all of the things. But Bettina shows love, show me love. Like she know who I was. Like they, they <laughs> really like these are women that you see now that you know their careers are getting just so huge. But they are they were at their core, and that's who I follow and support. Like yes relational people and people who are like they really live this stuff this is not um people who are don't look at them and just think like oh they're da, 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 da. no they are really living this stuff they're really loving they really care they can't do everything and i don't and i don't like calling them for everything because they're busy right we also need to be protect them and protect like i'm very protective of them we need to protect their time and their energy and everything like that. But they are beautiful, wonderful, and they have really been there for me throughout this. And, um, you know, whereas Farima and I, we came up, we kind of came up through the doctoral program together. So she is one, when I said people that some of my closest friends, she's in that group. And so I think, and you, you attract those people. When you're doing what you're supposed to be, you attract the right people. You just, it just happens. You yeah. know, um, and, and that's who you need to be around and people that's moving right, people that's that's kind, people that are relational that actually be trying to help people. That's who you want to be, that's who you want to be like, and that's who you want to be with. And then it's wow. my job to now pass that forward. I you know, because people have done it for me, and that's what I'm supposed to do. Listen, Tiffany, I cannot tell you just the amount of gems that you know. Dr. Yolanda C. Ruiz, even Dr. Gold Muhammad, like all these people you mentioned, they've given me so many gems and I'm not even someone who's in the academy. You know, I just have them come on to just share their story and yep. I'm learning as I'm listening to their stories. I'm like, whoa, like these people are so dope yep. and they're so down to earth and grounded. Yep. And you can tell that even if they didn't have the claim that they have now, they would still be doing this work. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. They would, they would still be doing the work. Absolutely. And that's really the defining characteristic about all of them. They're as authentic as they come. Yep. Ooh, man. You know, I'm looking at all these questions. I'm like, you know what? This is how the conversation is supposed to go right here. Like, we, <laughs> like we did that. <laughs> I do have one more question. Yes, no, you're fine. I'm loving it. No, this is good. This is some good stuff right here. So, you talk about this idea of race-based 
critical professional development. So I was able to read up on it and it's like, okay, this is something that's important. I want to know how critical is it for us to have this type of prof- professional development space with all the anti-critical race theory propaganda that's being spewed out um, right now in our political circles, if you will. So how does that race-based critical de- um, professional development factor into what's going on currently in our climate? So first of all, you already posted it on this, and I'm about to say again, Kwame, you already said this in a tweet or something, that we really focusing on the wrong thing with that critical race theory. We know what that you 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 done said this already, but I'm gonna take your words, say it. Yeah. Like okay. this is this is a distraction, right? About this is just you know, white supremacy doing what they what white supremacy does is pick something and not really know what it's about, but, you know, and just try to make it the new focus and a new enemy, right? Race-based critical professional development is based, builds upon, um, um, crit- I don't even say builds upon, I would say it's situated in critical race theory, right? Mm-hmm. Where we um, believe we center the, the stories and experiences of people of color, um, we understand racism to be a normal everyday practice in, in um, U.S. society. And we, you know, we are working towards, at the end of the day, it's about social justice. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff in critical race theory, but that's all I'm going to say for now. Race-based critical professional development is for, really is when we're thinking about when I talked about before about how we only, when we talk about, when we, we do professional development on racism or anti-racism, we usually only center white teachers and their learning needs, right? Right. In race-based critical professional development, we're centering all of the teachers there. Even if there's only one or two teachers of color, their learning needs matter too, okay? <laughs> In these topics. Also, we believe in their instruction is differentiated. So all teachers do not need racism one-on-one. And all teachers are not ready for intersectionality. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) No, I got you. So we're thinking about that. But also, really, um, uh, the the thing about it is that most of the time, this learning... So there there are people like, like Farima who do affinity groups where it's like where they do work with just teachers of color, and that's a different atmosphere. With race-based critical professional development going into schools and, and doing this type of work, you're going to have a multiracial group. And one thing we have not done well is how do we do this type of work with, with, in a multiracial group of teachers in ways that everyone's learning needs are met and in ways that we're responsible to and for one another in that space. And so that's what we're doing. We're talking about racism. We're talking about, we do it a lot through book clubs, um, critical consciousness, uh, consciousness raising exercises. Um, But also we're observing, we're taking information that we observed in your classroom, your daily practice, and we're using that to inform how we shape what's happening in the professional development. And so we're thinking about everybody's different levels. Um, and this is not easy to do. Yeah, it's, it sounds, it's, sounds challenging. <laughs> yeah, it's challenging, but it's something that we should be working towards. Because what happens is your teachers that are already on board, that are already social justice, but they still need other things in these topics, right? They're bored, right? They're bored or they don't like it because then they get stuck with the racist group you know, and they got to be the one saying this or whatever. It's also done in smaller groups because it goes back to the history of teacher learning where teachers would be in small inquiry groups. So in the late 1800s, early 1900s, that's how teachers did professional development. There was not these huge mass groups mandated where you're in a room with a hundred people and you just doing a module and you just sitting there listening. They would kind of shape they're learning around it. So teachers' voice is centered in race-based critical professional development, what they want, how they want to shape it. We don't put it all on the teachers, but I mean, like, 
but right. they, they matter because I think that's also you you have to have teacher buy-in and you have to respect teachers as knowledgeable and that they have something to contribute to this space as we continue to go deeper with it. And so all of that is happening. Um, I'm actually working on a, several manuscripts and I'm trying not to say, <laughs> say everything about it before I like have my on this on race-based critical professional development. So hopefully in the next year or two, you stuff will be more stuff will be published on it. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think white teachers get and race and races white teachers get very centered in these conversations, focused on, and their learning needs becomes everybody's learning needs. I I agree. I feel like a lot of the anti-racist work is done within this white gaze. Yeah. So like right now, a book that I'm reading is like I'm reading Robin D'Angelo's the new book, Nice Racism. Mm. And it's a well-written book, and it's pretty much a continuation of white fragility. Hmm. But you can tell the way it's written is for white folks. Yep. Like the stuff that she writes about, like, yeah, like I'm very much aware of it. She's just saying it in a more sophisticated academic jargony kind of way. But it's yes. On the backs of scholars of color, because scholars of color yes. have already done all of that work, right? That that's what I mean. <laughs> And and that's that's another thing too, but we we could tell with that conversation, um, cause that that would just get me into a soapbox. Right. But I do agree. I think the thing that I'm thinking about, and of course we we don't have time to talk about it now, but how do you manage the traumatic responses, particularly of people of color, mm-hmm. right? And then with regard to white folks, the fragility tears the white guilt. Because mm-hmm. when you have that multiracial grouping mm-hmm. happening, when you're engaging in uh, race space, mm-hmm. professional development, these are things that you're going to have to anticipate, yep. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And so how do you navigate all that? Yeah, and this, this is what my research was on. So I actually did it. You know, you know that. I think, I, I'm not going to say that this is easy, but I do think that it's so based on the facilitators. I'm trying to say like, cause I'm like writing about this, but I'll say a little bit. The It's so based on the epistemologies and the ways of being of the facilitator. Mm. And so the facilitator has to work from a place of relationships, from a place of love, from a place of seeing everyone. So that then in turn that is reciprocated to the facilitator and to the other people that are in there. Okay. And so you do, you do need to, okay. So let me, let me, let me be clear about this. The reason why I'm saying multiracial, not because I want my work to be, I don't, I want to only do race based with multiracial groups. I want to be clear about that. It is because that's the situation you often see when you're in schools. Okay. Even when there's a tons of white teachers and we say, oh, it's only white teachers in the school. It usually be one or two, (laughs) you know, (laughs) We, we somewhere in there, you, you know, we just ain't the majority. Right. And so that is, that's where I'm coming from, but I'm not saying that, but I think affinity groups are important. And I would even say that, you know, you, sh- you could, you should have some type of affinity group for people of color happening at the same time when they're doing, when they have to be in a multiracial space. And, um, you know, I'm going to really have to find out more about, so about what to do with people like the the fragility um i do had i did ha- see it but it was displayed differently it wasn't tears it was more gestures okay. so i am working on doing some multimodal analysis of that um of hearing certain things and being like you know just do still shots of the faces like you know uh and so i do think that I, I, I'm also not afraid to challenge. I think I, I am, I'm loving, but I'm also not afraid to challenge. And I do think the book club piece is really huge because sometimes you can have a very powerful text that says what you don't have to say. And it says it, and then you just bring it up and talk about it. And I'm very picky about the text that I choose. So I wouldn't choose a text that was written for black uh, white people with a white gaze on it. I purposely do not choose text like that 
to use in professional development um, because it's not helpful. And they need to, um, it, it may be helpful to a degree, but it's going to make, it's to make you comfortable. And I want you to sit, I want you, if we're really doing critical race theory, if we're really doing critical race theory, then we are going to center the perspectives and we're going to learn from the experiences and knowledge of people of color to help us to understand how to be anti-racist. Mm. And that's how we're going to learn. And so wow. that's how we do that. Yeah. And what's crazy about the white gaze is even though it might be helpful for white folks to understand what we go through as people of color, you just mentioned it. White gaze pretty much falls in line with that right to comfort, which yep. we also know is aligned with white supremacy culture. Yeah. So, so it's like pretty much. So it's like, yes, you have these books are written that way, but they're written in a way that pretty much almost like lessens the blow, yeah, <laughs> if you will. And it's like, if I was learning science, would you dumb it down for me so that I could get it? No, you would still teach it the way it needed because I needed to learn that. And even when I teach in teacher education programs, I let them know like where I was at before when I was at Buffalo State College and I taught a lot of diversity classes. And they, people just think they're supposed to take these classes and just get an A because they said racism is bad and mm -hmm. women are great and uh, trans lives matter. And so now they're good. And I'm like, no, there's things, you, real things you have to learn. And there's things you have to think about and you have to understand. Um, and so, and I think that's the same thing with, with these topics. And I don't think we're helping, I don't think we're helping even white people be better by coddling them. You know, yeah, we're, we're not. Yeah, we're not helping them by coddling them. I don't. I don't do that. I'm not. I'm a. I'm a pretty nice person, but I'm also not going to be like. Uh, I'm not doing all of that. Like you. Like, this is what it is. Now I do do things where, when I'm teaching courses, with um a lot of white students, I do a lot of front loading before I give them certain topics. Like I may give them a lot of background about certain terms because what you're not going to do, whether it's in a professional development or in a college class with Tiffany Neachai, is you're not going to be throwing around words you don't know what they mean. So mm. if you're going to use words and diversity terms that you just picked up off of Fox News or whatever, <laughs> okay, you're going to make you gonna make sure you know what you talk about. And so I, 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 I get rid of... see. This is the other thing we have to realize. And, and people, all of us, everybody, a diversity and equity inclusion officer and everybody's this, that, and the other. You still got to do good teaching. Even with diversity topics. You do. So how are you rhetoric? How are you scaffold? You still have to scaffold with these topics, right? So how are you readying them for white supremacy? And it's not coddling. It's teaching. Yeah, pedagogy is key. That pedagogy is key. So by the time we get to, by the time I pull out Bettina Love book, we done, I done got you ready. We done broke down what whiteness really means, right? Mm -hmm. What white supremacy really means. We done broke down all of this stuff and identity. Da, 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 da. Now you ready for this and you may feel some type of way, but it ain't going to be like if I just gave it to you. Wow. So I think that I think that matters, and I don't think it. I'm not, I don't think it's going to get rid of every problem. You're still going to have people that are going to resist that and the other. But I had I was teaching a class on elementary social studies for elementary students a few years ago. Had the students throwing around developmentally inappropriate with because I wanted them to tell the truth about Columbus, and I said, "Oh, developmentally inappropriate, appropriate, and all this." I said, "Well, let me pull out. Let me tell you what development because I'm certified in early childhood." Amen. So don't don't do it, okay? So like, I was like, <laughs> like they use it in that context. Yeah, using it like any mm -hmm. type of critical anything is developmentally inappropriate. So I said, let me go pull out what that means. I see this is my book from when I was in undergrad. Just in case you forgot what DAP really means, and just so you know, it was by the National Council for the Education of Young Children. Who, mm -hmm. if we go to their website, they have a whole list of anti bias goals. So they talking about from from babies, from toddlers, to about second grade. So develop what? And they <laughs> like, what can you say? They can't say nothing. You can't say nothing. No rebuttal. 
at you that know? point. And that's and I think that's also the racial fatigue too. Like mm. I feel like we always have to be so excellent. Like excellent, excellent, excellent. Like I have read the book and the other books and da, 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 just in case you try to come for me. And that but, does but that's the problem though. Yeah, it is. It is we should problem. begin the white folks to be doing that. Right. They need to do that. <laughs> they need to read the stuff. And that's and but that's why also I'm very picky about what I participate in. Mm. You know, I'm very picky about the extra work that I do because let me tell you, so I, this is what they don't get. Don't try to don't try to give me no extra diversity work because you know what? I'm doing it when I don't want to do it. I'm doing it all the time more than you. It's not an optional thing for me. You know, I always got to do it. To do my job well, I have to be a walking social justice statement. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, and it's like, it's like, so I think that's why, because you're going to do this work so much, you got to be very picky about the extra stuff that you do. Yeah, I totally agree. Whoo, wow, yeah. Tiffany, man, you was about, you about to break this record now. We going on ninety minutes, but Ooh. this has been this has been awesome though. This has been awesome. So we're definitely not gonna do a lightning round because <laughs> I feel like what we talked about is so much more important. So this is gonna be one of the rare times where I'm just gonna be like, you know what? Let's throw the lightning round out the window. But um, here's what I will say. I want to say thank you for your transparency. This has definitely been one of the most entertaining and most like fun interviews I've had. I'm glad. And we're going on what ninety plus episodes of this podcast. Yes, I better but, let me give myself a pat on the back. Yes, please do. Please do. And then also the fact that like this is a sister with a PhD, y'all, and she's down to earth, humble. Like she doesn't have to boast that. Like you just come as who you are, and and that's the part that like I love more than anything is that you, you're not. You don't have to tell people, oh, I got a PhD and, and all this other stuff. You pretty much just come as you are, and it's as if you don't have one, if that makes sense. Like, you just... <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take like you, it. Like, you the homie. Oh, I love it. I want to be the homie. Like That's you the my homie. dream. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Goals. <laughs> the homie. Yes. Yes. Yeah, but yeah. Tiffany, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, before you go, please let people know how they can connect with you on social media and also uh, share the website for Evolving the Education Project. Okay, thank you. Yes, hook us up, Kwame. Yes. Um, so I am on Twitter, um, Tiffany underscore Nichai, N-Y-A-C-H-A-E. Um, you know, but it's probably better if you follow Evolving Education Project stuff. So... <laughs> Uh, we are so the website is um, evolvingeducationproject.com, um, and there you can find our right at the top. You'll see our Instagram. We really want to grow our Instagram followers. You know, I'm really working hard on this social media, y'all. So just be patient, but I'm trying. Um, <laughs> but we want to grow that. The Instagram. We have a Facebook page. We have a Twitter, and I'm on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. I mix both of my worlds. So um, Tiffany and me and Chai on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, so those are, that's where you can find me and us. And I hope you can listen. If you, if you listen to this great podcast, um, hopefully you can listen to our podcast and we got to have Kwame on. We're going to get Kwame on. We're going to, I just, we have to do a series because I got to do you right. I got to come up with a whole series, you know, so I could put the iterations and put it all together, but we're going to do it. Um, so yes, thank you so much. And Kwame, I'm so, I cannot believe that I'm like on your show and I got to meet you because I'm telling you, I saw you. I was like, this, who is this young man? Look at what he's doing. This, this. And look at this, you know, then you reach out to me. I was like, wow, because I, cause you know how you see people, you be like, they are so, yes. And then we just, it was just meant to be. And so thank you for having me. And um, for your work and everything that you're doing, um, your voice is so important in the field and so needed. Um, and so I'm, I'm just thankful for your work and your voice and your perspective. I am. Well, thank you. And, and I feel the same way about the work that you're doing. And I just hope that Evolving Education Project continues to evolve. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. All right. 
So, man, we got to do this again because this was just such a good episode. And there's still so much that, you know, we had to talk about, but this is a good start. Yes, this is a good start. I like that. <laughs> yes. All right, Tiffany. So, we're going to do this again another time. Hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you. All right. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, y'all. So we're about to end another episode of I Dane Talk Educators Live. And as always, to my people who are listening and watching, I wish you all good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are in the world. We're going to do this again another time. Peace out, y'all.